Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 284 of the Mom Hour. I am Sarah Powers, here as always with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hey, Sarah. How you doing? I'm great. We have a good topic today. Today's topic was suggested by a listener, Alana, who sent us an email saying, do you have a list or suggestion of things to have on hand for cold and flu season? And I'll read more of her email in just a bit. But I I have to say, at first, I was like, no, we don't really we don't really make like printables or like handy checklists. And I was Mm -hmm. thinking, I'm not sure that's really and then I thought, wait, no, this is a this is a good episode topic because you and I, I think probably our medicine cabinets look a little different. It's a good episode to illustrate maybe some of the differences in our homes and our families and like our healthcare philosophies. But also 2020 is a year where you really don't want to have to run out in a snowstorm for children's right. Tylenol. So even those those more laid back among us who don't think about like having a fully stocked medicine cabinet, you know, right at the beginning of the season, I think it is probably a good thing to talk about this year because I have just noticed, I've noticed shelves being cleared out at yeah. CVS, um, you know, delivery times being weird, certain, certain products being low stock. And it's not quite where we were back in March, but, um, it's not, it's a good question, Alana. So yeah. And, and a lot of our businesses, the hours really have not come back. Like they're, yeah. they're open weird times. And I just, it made me laugh. I was thinking about when, um, the first time I went to CVS after like shutdown, you know, and I like kind of yeah. went in there with my list and my, I don't even think people were wearing masks yet. It was just like, you just didn't touch anything or go near anyone. Remember that feeling? And yeah. like walking through and I bought two enormous bottles of Tylenol. It was <laughs> like, I was, it was like my medicine chest version of COVID nesting. And the funny thing is we haven't even opened them. We really don't take Tylenol very much in this house because right. we're more Advil people. So it's like, I just, it made me laugh that I, that was how I nested. But I think yeah. it makes sense. Like you want to be prepared and we don't want to be running out. Um, no. Trying to run out in the middle of the night. So, And, you know, hopefully nobody's families are dealing with COVID right now. If you are, we're sending you all the best. But we know that with kids back in schools and daycares, um, we know there are going to be regular colds and flus and and not just that, but like we've had like skin issues with my kids lately. It's not yeah. just the sniffles and the coughs. There's also other things to have stocked that just make it a little bit less stressful. I want to share briefly a conversation I had with my um, best friend from high school, Sarah, who's a nurse now um, at the very beginning of the pandemic, like, but when people were running out and shelves were empty and she said, Cause I was saying that it almost stresses me out to think about stocking. Like it, here in California, we're supposed to have earthquake kits. And I've always had so much anxiety about purchasing an earthquake kit or stocking our emergency um, food source and all that. I know there are those of you out here who will relate for some of us. It feels like if you do that thing, it's somehow going to make it more it's like likely. Bad juju. Yes, yes, it is. Like you've, yeah. And I think a lot of people think like that. And I had this great conversation with Sarah early in the pandemic who said, you know, you can prep without being a full blown prepper. Like it doesn't, Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of room in the middle. She said, don't think of it. Like you have to keep your family alive in the apocalypse. Like don't go all the way there. Just think, what would I need to have in my house? If it was a hassle to go out to the store, if there was a snowstorm, if, if everyone in the house needed to isolate because of an exposure, she's like, you're not going to die. You're like, someone would drop off some Tylenol. It's going to be fine but would it be a little less stressful to have what you need on hand? And I don't know why just her framing it that way made me think a lot different about this concept of like emergency preparedness stocking up, which I always kind of avoided because even though I like to be prepared, I don't like to think about those really bad things. And so it had created this weird tension. And now I don't think that way at all. Now I actually think it's a great strategy to like, okay, what would make my life easier? Not what's going to save my life, but what's going to make it easier if someone spikes a fever so that I don't have to run out and I don't have to like, have this weird COVID thing of like, well, someone in my house has a fever. Am I allowed to leave the house? Right. It's all so much more complicated this year. Yeah. And I think that there also was a lot of um, negativity around people going out and buying things like preparing. Mm -hmm. And the way I looked at it was like, it's not one person that clears a shelf. It's because everybody at once realized it was probably smart 
to Mm -hmm. prepare for future self, for future Megan and future Sarah. And Mm -hmm. we're all doing it as a collective, you know, we're doing it collectively. So the collective effect is you end up with cleared shelves, but it's not like any one of us, we're not bad people for wanting to have like extra pasta on our shelves because I had the same feeling about that. Like, yeah, am I going to starve to death if we don't, you know, if, if there's two weeks and we can't go to the store? No, of course not. Would it be nice just to have some extra spaghetti sauce and noodles in the, in the pantry just in case? Yeah, that would be yeah. nice. Like it might save us all a lot of hassles. Um, so I totally agree. It's just for your future self. High fives. From High fives self. from our future selves. We've talked about micro stressors, I think, didn't we? Was that a concept we talked about on this show? Or maybe we referenced so. an article yeah. about like micro stressors, but it is one of those things, not being out, not knowing if your thermometer works. Oh, I've yeah. been there. We're like, I have a thermometer, but I, I don't actually know if it's accurate. Like l- those are little things that add up yeah. in a year like 2020. So I don't actually know where mine is. That's also a right. stressor. Yeah, totally. Well, um, specifically, Alana said her girls are three and 17 months and then there's her and her husband. So she's just looking to generally update the medicine cabinet for this cold and flu season. She said we're not totally homeopathic. She doesn't mind trying some natural things, but she also has no problem with taking some Dayquil to survive the day. That made me smile because I would I would say that that's about where I fall too, on like mainstream versus natural and homeopathic. Like I'm open to anything that helps me and my family feel feel better. And that includes all that includes a lot of things. So, um, I think it's also good to mention that not everybody's medicine cabinet will look the same, right? Well, and I think it's, I think it's good to just kind of know what, um, your health philosophy is right. Otherwise there's two, you got to narrow it down somehow. If you just go and start shopping, (laughs) even (laughs) if you're like just at CVS looking at like the kids section, there is a, an, a dizzying array of things you could buy. Um, everything from pain relief, to like cough and cold formulas, to the homeopathics, to the herbals. And I mean, there's a huge difference between herbal and homeopathic medicines. And so like, I think when I look back, when my kids were really little, I really didn't use almost any, what they call allopathic medication, like more like drugs, you know, like, um, like what your doctor would prescribe or like, Mm -hmm. like an over the counter, like, uh, like Dayquil or something. Uh I did besides like the occasional acetaminophen or Advil, but that was definitely like a conscious decision for, so for me, stocking up would look like knowing what I would be using and then having that. So I never had a middle of the night emergency for something I wasn't going to use anyway. You know what I mean? So like if like your miles will vary, if you're listening and you're like, well, I would never use Dimetap or, or or Sudafed or whatever the thing is that we throw out there. If you know that about yourself and you know your comfort level and you have a plan for how you're going to handle a symptom with what you do choose to have, then it relieves some of that anxiety because otherwise you could buy every product on the shelf and then you don't know how to use them. You don't know how they interact with each other. Um, yep. And they'll all know expire. If, like, <laughs> and they'll all expire. <laughs> so like, I would definitely say spend some time thinking about what your personal plan is for how you'll deal with a cold, how you'll deal with a fever, whatever it is. And then, you know, there's, I'm sure listening right now, a huge swath, like a variety of the ways different moms are comfortable dealing with different kinds of medication. Um, And I don't want to get into specific remedies, especially in the natural realm, because it's really personal and you really have to understand what you're doing. But then if you do lean more toward herbal or natural medicine, get a good book and read it Mm -hmm. and understand how the products work and how some of them should not be used with more traditional, like, and I don't mean traditional because it's actually opposite of traditional, but like more modern, right? Like Mm -hmm. drug style meds. Like you have to kind of decide which isn't to say you can't dabble in both, but you kind of have to decide what your first line of defense is. Mm-hmm. And if your first line of defense is going to be, you know, warm compresses and, uh, and a vaporizer and maybe like a, a good herbal cough syrup, then your medicine chest may look really, really different than if you know, that's probably not, you're just going to go for like something else. So right. I, um, the book smart medicine for a healthier child was one that I have still got on my shelf. And I think it's really good. And balanced and kind of covers the gamut, but there's also, there's a million and Mm -hmm. there's a million that will tell you how to use all these different things, make your own. Um, that's just kind of my, I guess, nod to like, you can get away with very little in your medicine chest if you're comfortable and confident and that's how you know you're going to handle it. Mm -hmm. But if you're not, it's good to have more stuff. (laughs) Well, right. Yeah. (laughs) It's solving for the 2 a.m. The 2 a.m. hassle. And like you said, right. There's no emergency if you weren't going to if you weren't going to go to the medicine cabinet in the first place at 2 a.m. And then I 
I would just add to that, that um, knowing how to contact your trusted provider, including at 2 a.m. is a really key piece of this, because whether it's more natural approaches or less natural approaches, um, having someone that you can call or put in a message and get a call back from a nurse line, because all of this over the counter or not just over the counter, things you would do at home really should be in conjunction with your professional partners at your, your right. healthcare team, whoever they are. So, um, yeah, I, I'm was curious, Megan, cause it has been a while for us. Have you guys had any colds or sniffles lately? Like this is now no. almost late October, which is weird. Honestly, no. And I am, I keep saying, I keep using a, a word that I cannot say on this podcast, but I feel that cold and flu season is going to be a total crap show. <laughs> I guess uh-huh. I can say that because everyone's going to think they have COVID. So it's like, yeah. I just, I'm like so bracing myself, but, um, I do feel like I've had allergies been going nonstop since August. And I did have a small sore throat and some ear pressure a few weeks ago, which worried me a little bit, but it went away, which I was very relieved of, but otherwise, no, nothing. Yeah. Will had a cold in July. What's that? Yeah. I have no idea how we got a cold. Where did I that know. come from? Well, I know I, I talked to a lot of parents of littler kids who still are getting colds, even if they have very little exposure to the outside world. So, um, I, I, I know there's science behind that. I just forget what it yeah. is, but yeah, um, we have not either. I mean, we've not had colds or tummy bugs or really any like virus type stuff at all for, for months, but we have had some allergies this summer. You know, we moved and we're more in the trees here. Um, we've had some bumps and bruises and we've recently had several different skin issues. So I'm going to talk about that later when we talk about our medicine cabinet, but like just everything from eczema to sun rashes to ringworm. So it, it, I have found myself going to the medicine cabinet for sure, you know, over the last several months, but not for the sniffles, which is usually such a, such a part of parenting right, right? and motherhood is the yeah. cough in the night and all that. And I know it will happen. So all right, well, let's let's take a break. And then what we're going to do is kind of go age by stage loosely, although there are some things, of course, that will probably be in most of our medicine cabinets, no matter what age of kids we have. But we'll go from the babies on up and just talk through a few things that were helpful to us back in the day or that we're restocking for this year. So we'll be right back. OK, Megan, all this working from home and moving and managing virtual schooling has me a bit snackier than usual. And you know me, I'm actually a kind of a snacker to start with. So I seem to wander into the kitchen several times a day, just rooting around for a little something, preferably a little something that's both salty and sweet, which is my favorite flavor combo. Well, Sarah, our new sponsor, Monk Pack, is your new favorite thing then, right? They make keto-friendly nut and seed bars with close to no sugar, but they've somehow cracked the code on also making them taste way better than most healthy snacks. Okay, I had to look at the ingredients like 10 times to try to figure (laughs) out how they did this, but Monk Pack bars contain less than one gram of sugar, two to three grams of net carbs, and they're only 150 calories. And they nailed that perfect balance of sweet and salty with a crunch from the whole nuts and seeds, but still somehow soft and chewy. Not surprisingly, my favorite flavors are the sea salt dark chocolate and the peanut butter dark chocolate. I am obsessed with the peanut butter dark chocolate. It's so Mm -hmm. good. In addition to being keto-friendly, Monk Pack bars are also gluten-free, plant-based, and non-GMO with no soy, trans fat, sugar alcohols, or artificial colors. They're perfect for a quick snack while you're working or to get some protein in you after a workout or just to satisfy a sweet craving without getting a sugar crash. Try Monk Pack bars for yourself and you'll see what we're talking about. And we have a special deal for our listeners. Get 20% off your first purchase of any Monk Pack product by visiting monkpack.com and entering our code MOM at checkout. Again, to get started, just go to monkpack.com. That's monk like a chipmunk. So M-U-N-K-P-A-C-K.com and select any product, then enter the code mom at checkout to save 20% off your purchase. We are welcoming back our sponsor, National PTA today, and specifically their Notes from the Backpack podcast, which is such a great resource for parents of school-aged kids. The podcast is hosted by Helen and Lawanda, two moms of young kids who chat with an expert in each episode to address a topic related to kids' learning, development, and success, both in and out of school. This season of the Notes from the Backpack podcast is tackling really timely questions that parents are grappling with this fall. Things like talking about race with our kids, finding online resources to support kids' education, and dealing with learning differences during COVID-related school disruption. Notes from the Backpack has listeners in every state and in more than 55 countries, so they're really tackling these questions in a way that supports a broad and inclusive group of parents. We know how helpful local PTA chapters are in our kids' schools, but I didn't realize just what a helpful organization PTA was at the national level. 
And I just love that they've gotten into podcasting because as a mom, that is my favorite way to learn new things. Check out Notes from the Backpack wherever you listen to podcasts or at notesfromthebackpack.com. Again, it's Notes from the Backpack, a podcast for parents from National PTA. Check it out. Okay, we're going to start with babies and toddlers. And in case it wasn't abundantly clear in the first half, Megan, you are not a, a healthcare provider. I am not a healthcare provider. We think you all listening should work with your healthcare providers that you trust on things like this. And even things you do at home, you know, should be used as as directed intentionally and call your favorite provider. If you have questions, don't listen to us. We don't even play one on TV. No, or on a podcast. <laughs> nope. Emphatically not medical, but we are moms of many kids who, you know, dealt with these things at home. So um, with the babies and toddlers, I'll just I'll just list the first few on the list for myself and then let you chime in, Megan. But um, having infant acetaminophen and infant ibuprofen once a baby's old enough, it used to be six months, but don't quote me on that. And knowing the dosage, which changed yes. over time, there were also some recalls a few years ago. So yeah. being up to date on your over-the-counter pain reliever and fever reducers and, and knowing how to use them and also knowing how to administer them, it's it's really intimidating if you just have like, say, a two-month-old who maybe got some vaccinations or spikes of fever. The first time you have to take a temp and the first time you have to give Tylenol um, feels so intimidating. And I, I can just tell you, you know, take a breath, slow down, read the instructions. Mm -hmm. It's going to be okay. It will become so second nature to you that you can do it like half asleep while nursing another baby and you can check a fever <laughs> and give somebody right. Tylenol. But it is, you know, so it, it, it now's a good time when you don't have a sick baby to make sure you have those things. Um, saline drops or saline spray, really key, at least for my sniffly babies. Um, and those are just, just, you just buy it at the drugstore, little remedies or, or one of those, uh, saline drops, um, a humidifier and, and replacement filters for you, your humidifier. Um, years ago on the podcast, Katie and I talked about how gross humidifiers get. And like, she used to clean hers like weekly for like an hour. And I was like, Oh, I just throw mine away and get a new one. But, um, however you like to keep your humidifier and make sure you don't have gross filters in it. Um, and then the thermometer for taking the temp. And I feel like I didn't do this well in the early days, but my strategy for thermometers now is I like to have two to three not fancy digital thermometers, you know, way back when they were babies, you could take it rectally. Um, or now my kids would just take it under the tongue. But I liked having several cheap ones because I feel like no one thermometer is all that accurate. And really what I'm looking for is a baseline and I'm looking for a change in the fever. Is it going up? Is it staying the same? Is it responding to meds? Um, and so I have a few cheap ones and I would take my own temperature first whenever I could just to get a read on like what a normal, like what is this thermometer really saying get about baseline? like- baseline? Yeah, get a baseline. Yeah. And then yeah. um, when I was in the rectal, in the rectal thermometer days, they <laughs> used to have these little plastic sheets that would um, slip over the thermometer so you could take yeah. a rectal temperature and not, you know, have to think about putting that in someone's mouth at a later date, even, you know, after wiping down or whatever. So that right. was like five things. And I'll, I'll pause there for any reaction, Megan. Well, I mean, yes to all the above. I guess I would say with um, infant acetaminophen and ibuprofen in particular, like I don't know what the world of those products is like now. But I do know that there was a lot of talk about the different formulas like suspension, liquid, all that yep. stuff and how easy it is, particularly with acetaminophen to overdose babies, yes. because if you switch back and forth, if you're used to using um, the liquid, it's a totally different like dosage than the suspension. So just keep that in mind, particularly if you're using if you're like using and reusing syringes and um, the little I don't even know what you call them, the little dosing spoons like. Mm -hmm. It's great to keep those and reuse them because it sucks when you don't have, can't uh -huh. put your hands on one and you really need one or the one you want to use is all sticky because like you didn't get around to cleaning it the night before. But just keep in mind, those may not be, they may not be compatible. Like yep. those droppers may, the dropper you choose may have a completely different dosage. Even if it looks the same, sometimes they're just a little bit wider. Like they, yep. they look very similar, but they're not. So not to make anyone paranoid, just something, no, I, it's really just something smart. to look at. Very smart. Yeah. Yep. Um, that's all. Okay. I never, I never gave a baby a rectal thermometer once, by the way. Never. I didn't do it very often either. I just, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> I have a, a long history of determining fevers by kissing 
foreheads. Yes. That's how scientific Me I am. Well. And oh, I, wait, I did it once and uh, there was a lot of poop afterwards. That's, <laughs> I did it one time and it basically like it was like an oil rig of poop. After, like, <laughs> oh the God, only oh way God. I can describe it, it created a reaction that I never cared to see again. So, oh, my gosh. Yeah, I didn't do it a lot either. And I actually well, now we're in COVID times and taking temperatures has a new meaning now because sometimes right. you have to for school and daycare. But I was not a big temperature taker because I always I we've talked about this in past episodes. I always went yeah. with the behavior of the kid. Me too. And, yeah. and the fever combined with other symptoms rather than the number. Um, but when you're when you do want to take a temp, it, it does help to have a functioning thermometer. And I recommend yes. inexpensive ones that may be having more than one in case one's out of batteries or whatever else. Um a quick tip that isn't really related to the actual stuff in the medicine cabinet, but um, in our last house, I kept all the kids' medicine that I might need in the middle of the night in the kids' bathroom up high in a cabinet. Um, my kids were older, so I didn't, this was not like a, a safety issue, but um, it just meant that I didn't have to go downstairs to where the, the rest of our main kind of health and safety stuff was. Right. So um, you might think strategically about where you keep um, just those key things for middle of the night fevers or teething or whatever you're using. Um, it doesn't have to be where everything else is. You might have like a secret stash that's close by. And I have it kind of spread around my house too. So I have yeah. um, a little basket of meds in my bathroom closet, which I, in my past, in my last house, I really didn't have a really good medicine chest. So that, that function is the medicine chest, but there's a drawer in the kitchen that has things that I just found us needing a lot when we weren't upstairs. Yeah. So like, um, I don't know, there's Advil down there. There's some Claritin. Cause I feel mm -hmm. like there'd be a kid walking through the kitchen, rubbing their eyes and sneezing. Cause they decided yeah. to rub their face on the cat for a little while or something. Yep. I'd be like, Hey, and, and then I don't have to stop what I'm doing. I can just like, I can be stirring with one hand, walk over to the drawer, pull it out with the other hand and hand a kid a Claritin. That's easier. Cause I don't have to dose my kids anymore, but right. Yeah. Yep. No, I agree. And that's kind of how we approach things too. Um, a couple of skin related things. I, I had many doctor or nurse practitioners recommend just Vaseline or Aquaphor for a variety of skin rashes, prevention, depending on how rashy your babies are. And those, they last for a long time and they're inexpensive and just, just having them around for any variety of skin things. Um, and then I really liked any zinc based diaper creams like, um, butt paste or badger balm. The zinc, like the really thick white, um, yes. was really good for both preventing and treating. I guess I don't know if desidin would be the same. It's like, the same. It's, it's zinc based. It's all the same. Okay. It's all zinc based, but I do think like desidin has like a like a mentholated quality yes. to it that I don't know if the other ones do. Yeah, I really liked that Badger Balm. Um, I'll link it up, and I had that later for Violet. Which company was it that came with the little applicator? Was it butt paste? That was that butt came paste. With the, We've worked with oh, them as so a sponsor. Oh, so genius. Yeah. That's right. Oh my gosh. Like, that was a great one too. I was just thinking about all the years of desitin under my fingernails. <laughs> so gross. It's yeah. so gross. Well, I don't know where say, it's been. <laughs> I was going to say, Violet even had kind of itchy, itchy bum and itchy girl parts, even post diapers, like maybe in the preschool ages. And um, yeah. so I think that stuff can help uh, beyond yeah. maybe even baby butts. So um, those are another couple of a, a diaper rash can go from mildly irritating to really miserable, like pretty quickly. Yeah. So that's another thing just yeah. easy to stock up and have on hand. Um, along those same notes, I usually have some kind of herbal skin ointment. They usually have something healing in them, like comfrey or lavender or, you know, all of the above. And they're good for like kind of everything. So like if your kid has like a little itchy bug bite that is just kind of bothering them. Sometimes it's just nice to have something to put on it. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's not going to cure it, it's just good to have like a little something to put on it or a little, a little rash, or a little scratch. Um, there's one called the green salve from a company called mother love herbal. But honestly, there are dozens of these. You can find them anywhere now. Like there's so those kinds of things have become so easy to find mm -hmm. and you can also make them yourself, which is kind of fun. Oh, that is cool. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I did not do a lot of Pedialyte popsicles. Um, my what I found was that my kids, when they had stomach bugs, when they had actual like barf viruses, they did not have any interest in sucking on a Pedialyte popsicle. I always wish yeah. they did. Like if I, if there was something with electrolytes that I could give them, but honestly, by the time they felt like having something, they just wanted regular juice or water or yeah. whatever. 
However, if you have a kid who really barfs or is really prone to dehydration, it's not a bad thing to have because of the the popsicle ones you can keep in your freezer. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they'll last for quite a long time. And so if that's, if it's a kid who just won't drink water or really is prone to dehydration and they like that kind of thing, um, the few times I had them on hand, I was like, oh, that's good. It's a good, it's a good tool to be able to offer, um, for the tummy bugs and like the barf fests. So. Um, just a note on Pedialyte. There are lots of hydration products out there and they don't all taste the same. I think my kids had some kind of, um, I don't know, they just really didn't like Pedialyte itself, mm-hmm. maybe because it's sweeter, which makes it probably good as a popsicle, but maybe not as a drink for a kid who doesn't really like sweet drinks. I don't know what it was. I have had luck with other kinds of hydrating drinks that okay. aren't that brand. Um, I just say, make sure that they, the ingredients in them aren't like an adult you know, a lot of them have additives. You don't yes. want like an adult level um, right. dose of like, you know, vitamin C or something on a two year old. But a lot of them are just basically electrolytes and no different than um, than a Gatorade or a Pedialyte or one of those. So yeah. worth looking into if your kids absolutely won't do Pedialyte. Yeah, good call. And also tummy bugs and hydration was one that I really learned a lot from the nurses who would call back from the doctor's office. And you might think like, oh, it's just like a 24 hour bug. Like I know how to do this, but I learned I was kind of doing things wrong for a while with regard to like when to encourage my kids to eat something, how long to wait before eating the next thing. So I don't know, right. just a, just another vote for there's no harm in calling the nurse line or checking in with, with a professional, even if it's something, you know, you're not going to take them in for, yeah. um, they may just have good tips or they might even just have good tips on their website. I think that's getting better too, where you don't have to wait or yeah. for a callback or whatever. Or telehealth now. I wonder if that's making those yeah. 2 a.m. calls a little, maybe there are people, I don't know if there are people on, on call 24 hours a day, but that would, oh my gosh, like think about how great that would have been. Yeah, totally. Little yeah. Ones, text, so. like a text back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. Well, let's move into little kids. And as we, as we move in here, there's going to be a lot of like, you already have everything we've talked about so far in your medicine chest. So now here's some things to add. So we're sort of building along here. Um, when you, when we get into the pain relievers and fever reducers, just want to repeat what you said, Megan, which is you have to stay on top of dosing and suspension because there's a difference in infant versus children's. And if you have infants and toddlers and children in your house, it it can be confusing. So just, yeah, I'll just say everything you said earlier, Megan, about dosing and suspension, because not, it's not that you can't give infant acetaminophen to a two-year-old. You probably can, but you just want to make sure, you know, it's not the same as the children's right. that they could also have like a two-year-old might right. be able to have both, but you need to look at the dosing. So yeah, you know, have those on hand. Um, Benadryl or an antihistamine. I, I like to have an oral anatopical for any kind of a histamine reaction. Um, you know, we've had bug bites that swell up really fast. We've had Mm. different really itchiness. Um, and I've also had doctors and nurses tell me to try Benadryl for congestion symptoms when they were really, really stuffed up. Um, and even if it wasn't an allergic, um, cause, that, that, that drying out or that antihistamine could help some of the symptoms. So I'm not advising that, but I have had some doctors tell me that with, even with colds that weren't allergies. So Benadryl oral and topical have been not something we use a lot, but something I'd like to have. Yeah. I would say, even though we aren't like a big cough and cold medicine family, we use Benadryl kind of a lot. It just, there's so many purposes for it. And it really can, you know, you never know when your kids are going to get into something that makes them cough or sneeze or wheeze, especially if they're if they tend toward allergic, but like, yeah, the, that I have also heard that advice before that it can be used for congestion. I'd probably mm-hmm. be more likely to use Benadryl for congestion than like an ex, you know, something else like a, I can't even remember the names. There's like the expectorants yeah. and the other mm-hmm. one that thins the, so, that yeah. thins the secretions and stuff. Like I always just feel like Benadryl, I kind of know it. It's like a known thing to me. So I don't know, just a, I, another vote. <laughs> I think that the age recommendations on Benadryl can go lower than traditional mm. cough medicines and some other decongestants. So, yep. um, agreed. Um, I was going to say Neosporin or, or an antibacterial, um, cream and lots of band-aids because these yes. little kids are full of owies and they like band-aids. Um, but also I have kids prone to skin infection and skin issues. So I don't always think like, oh, let's put some, you know, antibacterial cream on it right away. I I don't usually. But then later I have definitely had stuff that takes too long to heal or turns into some 
other kind of skin issues. So no harm in having a little antibacterial cream and lots of band-aids to keep them Mm. from putting their dirty fingers in their alleys. (laughs) Yes. And some, you know, again, I know this is like, it's just a, uh, an emotional thing, but kids really do feel like having a band aid on an owie makes it mm-hmm. feel better. And the funny thing is, sometimes it does. Like, if you ever had a burn or like a, a like a raw spot, like a scrape, it really yeah. does feel better to have the like. I know you have to have some airflow through it to it, but sometimes that rawness, like putting something over it, really and like some pressure, really does seem to make it feel better. So it's got therapeutic value yeah. as well. Um, I want to give a shout out to a friend of mine who is a dad with six kids who lives in my area. So in this little small town that I live in and he and like, I think three other dads started a company for bandages um, made for kids with different colored skin. So, or Uh, adults too. So there's like a whole range of shades. It's called true color bandages. And I know they're, I know they got into target. I don't know if they're in all targets, but um, we can put the link in the show notes. It's true color spelled the European way. C O L O U R. And true without a C O L O U. You are. Yes. Uh, and true. Just T-R-U. So I just think that's kind of a fun thing. And, and you know, for I don't know that Band-Aid brand is doing that yet. Um, they should probably get on. And if they're not, but I just love that this is like a dad owned brand. And I know one of the owners. So that's kind of fun. That's cool really cool. That's yeah. really cool. Um, I was just going to say on more on the skin. I think we both have things to say about skin creams, but cortisone or a hydrocortisone cream was useful for me because I had toddlers with eczema and little kids with eczema. Um, And this falls under uh, one of those where if you have a prescription strength because you have at one time been prescribed it, um, it's nice to have on hand a prescription strength version of something. And that's not the same as like, you know, giving amoxicillin, like hoarding amoxicillin and giving it to your kid the next time they, you know, their ear hurts or something. I I wouldn't redose those kinds of antibiotics, but right. I do have some prescription strength skin cream that I will reuse on the next kid who gets that issue. Does that make sense? Like it's different yeah. than I guess I think of an oral antibiotic, but well, right. Because you know, it worked on that kid before and it was safe for them. And it's, yeah. Yeah, it's not internally, it's not being internally used. Um, I want to throw out something that's a little old school, but something I definitely used a lot when my kids were little. Um, we don't so much anymore, but I just, you know, older people don't get the same kind of like crusty nosed colds that like little kids do Mm -hmm. as much. So we used to use a lot of Vicks VapoRub um, or sometimes like a natural alternative, but they, Vicks VapoRub can be used on babies or toddlers two and older. I think they have a baby rub that's for little, like for three month old babies end up. Um, And you can also buy the stuff that goes in the vaporizer, which I think you can only use with maybe older kids Um, and not in the humidifier, but the actual vaporizer, like that pumps out the visible right. steam, you know, um, we used a lot of that. And again, does it fix anything? You know, maybe not, but it's the therapeutic. It feels good to breathe it. It's like something about giving your kid a little chest massage when they're feeling coffee and sick. I just think it's nice. And I always really liked the feeling of breathing in like mentholated air when I'm sick. Mm-hmm. It just feels soothing. So we used a lot of that when the kids were, um, little and, kind of funny now. I don't even know if I have a vaporizer anymore, but we used to go through them kind of like, cause you could put stuff in them to make the air yeah. taste and smell good and like feel therapeutic. So yeah. So I actually, I've never used one of the chest rubs or a vaporizer and not for any reason. Um, but right. I just never did. So I'm glad you brought that one up because I just, I don't think I ever used it growing up. Like I never had it done to me, Yeah, but yeah, that's a great one. What else? I wanted to mention this, even though I know you were saving this for big kids because I think you're having some skin problems in your house right <laughs> now. But for us, we used um, over-the-counter antifungal cream for weird bumpies and little weird patches on their skin and just weird stuff that you kind of rule everything else out. And then antifungal creams often worked. And there was a point where, honestly, I was not going to be bringing them to the doctor every three days because they had some new skin weirdness. And so like, I kind of got good at determining is this like a little itchy rash is this something fungal did they pick it up at daycare um and some of the it was just good to have on on hand I will co-sign that and yeah it's almost like for me I think of it as the trifecta of an antifungal an antibacterial and then a what would you call a steroid like a hydrocortisone and I have learned over time the types of skin issues that each one will respond to um, Reed had impetigo once on his face. That's bacterial. 
Um, but it's like requires a prescription strength antibacterial. Um, I think in Pitigo or is in Pitigo a fungus too? I don't know. I don't know, know. I don't know um, which one that is. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a bacterial and it can spread. So yes, I will just agree with knowing your, knowing the skin creams that you can, like you said, you're not going to drag the kid into the doctor just yet. You're going to see how it responds. And over time you just get better at being like, yeah, I'm going to try this one on you today. <laughs> right. I also, just as a um, nod to pregnant nursing moms, I remember there being um, a very famous breastfeeding doctor. I think his name is Jack Newman, who wrote a lot about, I don't remember what his association was, but he just wrote a lot about breastfeeding. And he had like a recipe you could look up someplace online or in one of his books. And you basically would mix together, I believe, antifungal cream cortisone and antibacterial cream for your nipples if you were having like severe pain, especially with a lot of cracking and stuff, because I think the point was it could be anything at that point. If you have like an open wound on your nipple, like it can become, you can get thrush in it and it could be fungal or you could get a bacterial infection, or it could be that your skin is just freaking out and you, and you need a cortisone. Right. So it's like, it kind of just like covered all the bases. And, um, I'll try to look up the, I'll try to look up the recipe for that and link it up in the show notes. Cause I remember that being something I was fascinated by back in my breastfeeding days. I seriously want to do that like for my own children. That's what I feel like we need right, right. now. It's just like a <laughs> cocktail of, yeah, Reed and Violet are just both really prone to gross skin stuff. So um, one other skin thing I will throw out there. And again, this is kind of like more in the um, natural medicine. And I'm not one of those people who thinks that like essential oils cure everything, but I do put some stock in just creating a soothing environment uh, when you're sick or fighting off a cold or just want to like calm the energy down. So I always have had tea tree oil and lavender oil on hand. Um, you know, aromatherapists do say they can be used neat, which means directly on the skin, but like oh. danger, caution, warning. Other people will say, don't do that because if your kid has sensitive skin, that's not a great idea. But okay. that's, I think, why they're some of the most popular ones. But you can also put them in the steam diffuser, the oil diffuser. You can put them in the bath. You can, you know, burn them and have them smell nice in the room. You can mix them up in a little you know, in a little ointment or something just to kind of, they both have like a healing, healing mm-hmm. properties and tea tree oil in particular has some antifungal, antimicrobial, um, mm-hmm. I don't know how, properties. So okay, I'm gonna actually, put I think that lavender my, might as well. In my mixture too. I'm just going <laughs> to put them on. You're putting all of it in. Yep. All of it in. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I just found the thing about nip. I, I was like doing a little Googling. Um, I'm such a good multitasker. It's called Jack, Dr. Jack Newman's all purpose nipple ointment. And it's got an anti antibiotic an anti-inflammatory and an antifungal. And I think you can just make it yourself. Oh my so. gosh. That's so funny. Yeah. I love it. Um, okay. Well, we are going to take a break and talk about big kids and our adult medicine cabinets when we come back. Sarah, you know, I'm a big fan of our sponsor ritual for lots of reasons, but I admit I hadn't really thought too much about how the ingredients in ritual stack up against a typical multivitamin. So I decided to do some digging and was really surprised to discover how many multivitamins out there contain sugar, synthetic fillers, artificial colorants, and even animal byproducts like sheep's wool and gelatin from hooves and hides. I mean, what? What? It is so weird how something that's supposed to be good for you can be chock full of really shady ingredients that you'd usually avoid. But Ritual isn't your typical multivitamin. Ritual's clean, vegan-friendly formula is made with key nutrients in forms your body can actually use. No unpleasant surprises. And Megan, we both agree that Ritual vitamins are really gentle on the stomach, even if you take them on an empty stomach. Well, I found out more about why they're so easy on the stomach, Sarah. Ritual is a delayed-release capsule, so it's designed to dissolve later in a less sensitive area of your stomach, so you can take them with or without food. Ritual is formulated with key nutrients, including vitamin D3, to help fill gaps in the diet. I really need D3 this time of year because I just get so little sun, and vitamin D3 deficiency can really leave you feeling blah and low energy. And with Ritual, you'll always know where your nutrients come from thanks to their one-of-a-kind visible supply chain. Ritual is now available for women, men, and teens, scientifically developed to help support different life stages, including their best-selling prenatal multivitamin. Your multivitamins are delivered to your door every month with free shipping always. You can start, snooze, or cancel your subscription anytime. And if you don't love Ritual within your first month, they'll refund your first order. You deserve to know what's in your multivitamin. That's why Ritual is offering our listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash the mom hour to start your ritual today. Again, that's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 10% off during your first three months. 
Before we jump back in, Sarah, let's remind everyone how to get signed up for our monthly newsletter because the next one is going out in just a few days. Yes. If you are not on our email list, we would love to have you on there. We send a personal essay once a month. We take turns and it's a really fun way to share some thoughts in a different format from the podcast or what we do on social. And then we also put together a full list of all our active sponsor deals and promo codes. So you have them all in one handy place. That's a great way to take advantage of all these great deals we're telling you about, even if you haven't listened to every episode ever published. Yeah. So in the newsletter, which goes out the first Monday of the month, We also share behind the scenes updates, announcements, our monthly Spotify playlists, and other things you might have missed throughout the month. Check the show notes for a link to sign up for our email list or visit themomhour.com slash newsletter and that'll work too. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so we're going to dive into bigger kids and adults um, as we move through our medicine chest. I did want to mention expired meds because I feel like (laughs) as someone who does kind of like to have everything on hand, that also means that you're inevitably not going to use it all and end up with expired stuff. And so um, I wanted to mention that once or twice I've had, I've called the doctor or nurse line. And if it was something I'm thinking of albuterol specifically, which is something Mm. that my younger kids have used with a nebulizer. And I've had the, the doctor say, if it's, you know, at the time it was a few months, maybe six months or less expired. And they were like, if it's been in a cool, dry place, like a hundred percent, the, the benefits to the kid receiving a breathing treatment versus waiting for the pharmacy to open in the morning or something. Um, so I guess I don't have any specific rules for how to know when something is like you shouldn't use it. But my general rule is if I'm going through my stuff and there are things that are two and three and five years expired, I'm immediately chucking it. But if I came across a bottle of like children's Benadryl, for example, that was good, that was expired sometime in 2020, but in the last couple of months, I might personally hold on to that. And Mm. if I needed it in a pinch, would probably use it. So there you go. It might be less unscientific. Yeah. But it's probably not going to be harmful, you know? I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And and then you could just put it on your list to replenish next time. But it's amazing how time flies because I'll be like, oh, I know I have a full bottle of, you know, children's ibuprofen in the cabinet and I'll look and it's like from 2015. I'm like, geez, like how, how has it been this long? So, um, just keep, a good thing to keep an eye on. And if you are doing like a full, like a full makeover, now would be a good time to just completely throw away the things that are, are way expired. Yeah. Well, and on a similar note, um, to your point earlier about like hanging on to prescription, you know, antibacterial cream or something like that. Um, I had two kids who both used al- albuterol and mm-hmm. And at, at some point I had lost track of whose prescription was the albuterol. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I hope that's normal because yeah. Owen and or Clara had both been prescribed it usually yep. like in urgent care, because I feel like those things always happen on the weekend or late at night, like urgent care or yep. ER. Right. And finally we just had a little stockpile of it. And then it was just like, okay, whoever needs it. I know it's been prescribed. I know yep. it's okay for them to use. So I don't really care who's, yep. I'm not going back to the ER right now for something no. I know I can solve. I would do exactly the same thing. And I think when in doubt, I would just call and say, I have this, it's sealed. And this is the, um, you know, the dilution strength or whatever, like, here's the, here are the numbers written on it. Is this what I should use? And and when I've done that, they've always said yes. So when in doubt, you can just, just ask, but yeah. Oh, the albuterol days. I always think those are done, but I still have the nebulizer and there will be, there will be a time or two almost every winter still that we have the the breather as we call it. I have a a really funny memory of like having like people at my house, um, particularly Jack was always needing albuterol Mm -hmm. and Owen at the same time would sometimes need it. So like if someone was (laughs) over and and I had my like machine, it would be like, okay, get in line kids. And they, they were using their own prescriptions and stuff, but just like the machine was there to be used and passed around among um, cousins and no, like, it's, wheezy little cousins. Yeah. It's so useful to have. If you are like brand new to motherhood or have never encountered this, the, the machine is just mine at least is not very big. It plugs in, it makes a really loud sound Yep, and it has tubing almost like breast pump tubing, like yep. same kind of flexible plastic tubing. And then you put the, you put liquid albuterol medicine in this little chamber and hold up, um, what looks like a, like a breathing tube or yeah. sometimes it's a mask. And it makes us steam like a vapor and that can uh, open up the airways, constricted airways due to asthma or like asthma inspired by respiratory infections. And um, yeah. And then there are other things you can put in the nebulizer. I have at times had steroids prescribed that you administer the same way. Um, Not very often. That's pretty few and far between. But um, we've just been a bronchitis pneumonia. 
family with little kids. So it's funny. I really have such like, like nostalgia over the, (laughs) over the nebulizer, even though it was the biggest pain to have to pull it out the middle of the night and all the pieces and like, you Uh know, like you had to turn the light on and all this. Uh Um, But it actually made me a little bit sad when Clara at one point, you know, her, someone just prescribed her an inhaler and was like, she's kind of graduated past this and she's not going to need it very often. So we're just going to do an inhaler and, you know, just take two hits on this if you ever feel wheezy. And I was like, oh, yes, we we had both for a while, too. Um, But I but if they were willing to sit for the nebulizer and they then I I still went with that because I always felt like they got a little bit more of it. But yeah, I'm not sure I'm nostalgic yet. Maybe a few more years. I think I just still think of like coughs that go for weeks and like yeah up all night and yeah good times well, with the nebulizer thinking about that and how I used to have to fight um Owen particularly to do the nebulizer just made me think of this question and of course this wouldn't apply to something where their you know their health is in peril but right. I'm thinking of things like you know pain relief medication or something like that how much control did you give your kids over whether to take it how much to take how to take it like was that something you allowed them to kind of, I'm thinking of something like pain medication with Owen, yeah. he would refuse. And I would say, this is just to make you feel better. It's not going to, you know, I would know that like, if he didn't take the Tylenol, it's not like he wasn't going to get better. It's not going to put right. his health at risk, but I wanted him to feel better, but he was so stubborn. And I kind of felt like it really wasn't my place to force him to take something that he didn't absolutely need. So I often yeah. wouldn't, I would just really lay, like, I would just say, Hey, just FYI you're going to feel so much better if you'll just take it. And he would not for years. So yeah, I don't know. That was always my approach, but I think I'm the same, especially with, um, I'm thinking of things like, I don't know, maybe it's a toothache or something before bed where I say, if you want to take some ibuprofen before bed, it will probably help with that throbbing or whatever, like a sprained ankle or something where it's like, this is going to help with your pain management, but I'm not going to force it on you. So I would definitely give kids the, the choice on that. Right. I let my 12 and a half year old, um, if she has a need for Advil, I let her just, I mean, I, I've taught her it, yeah. dosage um, yeah. and, and she'll still sometimes say, I think I'm going to take two Advil and I say, go for it. She's a, the size of an adult and very responsible. Yep. So I let her do her own. I guess when my kids have been on rounds of antibiotics, then I would make it not a choice Um, just because if we've gotten to that point where I've decided that antibiotics were the course of treatment, then I want them to work. And I, Mm. from my understanding, you kind of got to do it. Like they're not going to be halfway effective if you do it half the time. So that would be when I wouldn't make it a choice, but yeah. 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 And I think it's kind of funny now that Owen totally will take meds if he has to, because he at some point must have given in. I don't remember when, but he must have been like, okay, I'll take something. And then he was like, wait, I feel yeah. better. Sometimes yeah. it just has to be their idea with yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. Okay. <sighs> so should we talk about, um, I guess we're just moving, we're moving older in terms of the cough and congestion. And I'll just yeah. say briefly, we, we are not a big like cough medicine or cold medicine family. Like we're not a big Dayquil, Nyquil decongestant. Um, but, but having said that, because I had kids really prone to lingering coughs, I have over the course of the years tried, um, what I would call like big kid cough and congestion medicines. Mm-hmm. And that's where you have to look up because, you know, you weren't supposed to give anything till four, or maybe five or six for a long time. The ones we've used are Mucinex and Delsim. And these are all those I've used for, like, I would say ages five and up very infrequently. Um, but if, if a cough was just the all night coughs that just weren't stopping, um, I occasionally gave them a try. So I don't, I yeah. guess I'm mentioning that kind of half-heartedly, like not something I swear by, but something I was sometimes glad to have in the medicine cabinet. Well, it's funny because I remember when my big kids were really little, um, their grandma, my mother-in-law at the time, um, really being like the minute they had a sniffle or a cough, it was like reaching to the medicine chest and pull out, um, whatever it was, mucinex or there's a million of them, right? Sudafed, yeah. Robitussin. And it was almost like it was your parenting duty. And if I didn't do that, I would feel really under the microscope mm-hmm. and like I was screwing up. And I just kind of felt a little weird philosophically about using something to suppress symptoms Yeah, that early, especially when they were like, I'm talking, you know, one, two, three, four. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will say since then, it felt like over time, the news about congestion medicines and cough medicines just kept getting worse. Like I yeah. felt like every 
year or two, I would hear something about how they can mask serious symptoms or make symptoms worse or like it wasn't necessarily like the effect of the medication itself, but like how it would affect the course of the sickness. Mm. So I just kind of, I don't know now what the most current thinking is. I think I just found that like until they were like 10, I really just didn't want to like step into that. Cause I just didn't really, I didn't trust that what was the thing when, you know, Jacob, who's now almost 23 was a baby would be the thing. And I felt like as as things kept emerging that were more and more negative, I just didn't want to step into that. But I totally yeah. see how sometimes they help your kids sleep. Like they can't breathe yeah. or sleep otherwise. And so we we were kind of lucky that we were able to usually deal with it with something um, besides the nebulizer stuff. And then the nebulizer would just take care of it. But I'm talking about just like your standard cold yeah. cough. Like yeah. we were able to kind of deal with it with, you know, warm liquids. And they they do have... and compresses and vapor rub steamy and all shower. that steamy showers and yep. making a little tent over the sink. Um, and they do make, there are several like, well, there's tons of more natural cough medicines that actually don't do anything and really except soothe your throat. They're really more like, um, they just are soothing to take. It's like taking a spoonful of honey or something or like mm-hmm. lemon. And I felt okay about that because it wasn't really doing anything, but I just felt weird about the chemical ones. And I also feel very weird when I take, if I take a decongestant or a cough medicine, it makes me feel bizarre. So. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's strong stuff. I, yeah. I myself had a really nasty respiratory, um, in, I don't know, respiratory thing. I think it was just a virus. I never got, this is a two years ago last yeah. year. I, I had influenza a, but this is two years ago. I think I just had one really nasty one. And I did finally take myself to the doctor cause I thought maybe I had bronchitis or something. And she prescribed a prescription cough suppressant, like a prescription cough medicine. And I don't even take regular cough medicine. Um, and my first thought was it was crazy how well it worked. And so I thought like, Oh, like there is something like there is, yeah, there's something in this, but yes, I I would kind of agree that I was never totally sure. I think the the times I tried it were often when it was a post nasal drip to the point where it, it was affecting their sleep so much. And I knew they I knew it wasn't a deeper bronchitis or pneumonia because we'd been to the doctor, we'd gotten checked out. It was more just that the constant, the constant coughing at night. I think I really have post-traumatic stress from constant coughing at night for so many years. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. Well, let's move on to some even more fun big kid stuff briefly. I'll go through a bunch at once like I did earlier and then you can just jump in. But um, I have a lice kit, like one of the, you can do really natural stuff with lice. You can do less natural, more chemical. I'm not even going to go into that, but whatever you think is good for the treatment of lice. And maybe that's just the comb and not, not a treatment solution or shampoo at all, but just the fine tooth comb. I think that could work. Um, because that's honestly, mostly what I've done is just comb out the nits when we've had lice. So some kind of a lice kit, just tuck it away and hope that you never need to use it. Um, allergy, more like daily allergy meds for either for kids or even some adults can be, uh, they, you can dose for like, it's like six and up, like where they have a six to 11 dosage and then an 11 to adult. Um, so like your Claritin, your Allegra, those kind of allergy meds are good. We already talked about antifungal and antibacteria skin cream. So I don't even have to mention those. Um, Dramamine, I have kids who get motion sickness and it feels like I'm always, running out for Dramamine when I realize we're going to be in the car for a long time or something. So that's one that's just kind of nice to have. And then we've talked about um, Benadryl oral and topical. And that's just one that I try to, you know, have and replace if it expires, because like you said, Benadryl is just very versatile. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's very smart to have a lice kit. And I am not going to jinx myself by talking about my so far non my non exposure to lice. Let's just I know, leave it amazing. at that. I mean, I can't believe amazing. it, but <laughs> what about things like ACE bandages and stuff? Do you, st- do you keep things like that? I really don't. I, I want to say that a couple of our um, first aid kits have had some bigger gauze pads. And, yeah. you know, if you get a really bad skin knee where you just need something bigger than a bandaid, um, a but they gauze make pad. huge, they make huge bandaids too. Like that yes. cover your whole knee. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, I haven't kept ACE bandages because if I, I mean, when we've had broken arms, but I can't yeah. imagine like wrapping, I guess if I had athletes, maybe that's different. I don't yeah. have like teenage athletes yet. If as a dancer, I knew how to wrap an ankle or to support like a wrist that was like possibly strained, but maybe you were going to wait it out a couple of days before going to the doctor. I can see doing that. I just haven't had the need. What about you? Cause yeah. you have older. Um, athletes. I do, but like, I have more likely used ACE 
uh, bandages for myself <laughs> because mm-hmm. yeah. I, you know, have like hurt my knee running and like fell down on the ice a couple of years ago. And so I've had several times, it was just really nice to be able to wrap up a knee or an ankle or something. Um, we do use ice packs a lot. Yes. That we you have, have a, favorite a variety kind? in the fridge. Um, we have one called, it's, it's called peas. I mean, we literally oh, do use bags of peas sometimes, right. but like it's called peas and it's like a little, and I don't know what the company is. I feel like we just got it at, I don't know, CVS or something. Maybe it's a CVS brand and it's just, it's like squishy and like filled with these little bead things. I really like yeah. that. It's, it's, but you know, honestly, in, when in doubt, a bag of actual peas also yes. does the trick. Yes, so agreed yeah. <laughs> or a bag of actual ice or like a big, right. big blocky kind that you are supposed to use in a cooler. Like I've yes. used so many, so many things for, for ice yeah. packs, but yeah, that's a good one. We hadn't even talked about ice packs yet, but those get, those get used a lot. Do you use a heating pad? Do you have heating pads? We have heating pads. We usually, we have the kind that are like, um, you stick them in the microwave. They're full of rice yes, or whatever. What they're so versatile and they, and they, and they feel nice. Like they're heavy they're great. Yeah. and they like bend to the body part you're putting them on. So yeah, we have a couple of those too. Yeah. That's what we have too. I remember, do you remember plug in heating pads when you were a kid? Yeah, they like still I were, are a I, thing. I can remember the exact, um, covering like the little, the, the zip liner that was covering it's our like heating that, pad. That, that weird, um, like a pillow Cloth cover that, kind of yeah like an old-fashioned but you know yes. what I mean and like they were usually floral <laughs> yes, yes yes yep um and I can remember the little switch that turned it mm-hmm. on that plugged in it's so funny um okay well what about let's move into adults and we've kind of touched on a lot of this quickly um but for me I always have Advil and Tylenol or generic brand ibuprofen and acetaminophen in my medicine cabinet and a little thing of it in my purse. And I, I always have both cause I actually take them together for headaches. I take two Advil oh, okay. and two Tylenol together, um, which is a good strategy for not taking too much ibuprofen. If you're sensitive yeah. to ibuprofen or just don't want it to build up, um, cause they can work together. And, yeah. um, I've also taken a leave for headaches and Excedrin for headaches over the years, um, with varying amounts of success, but I like having both Advil and Tylenol on hand for myself and I almost always take them together. So, Hmm. yeah, I have, um, I always have Advil in my car and also in various places throughout the house. Like I have some in my medicine chest and I have some in my, that drawer in my kitchen and then I have Tylenol, but I really only use Tylenol when I'm really suffering and I, and I need to rotate or combine meds. Um, so for me, like an Advil would be more likely to like, I almost think of it as like a pre headache, like I don't mm-hmm. actually, the headache hasn't taken over yet, but I just feel it coming. And if I take like one or two Advil, I'll knock it out. Um, and I also realized that I was getting a little too, like a little too Advil happy for a while. So I really backed off and have not, and just haven't been taking it. Um, yeah. They're also good for muscle soreness and things like that. Sure. So it's good to have. And um, I, every now and then will just totally go crazy and take like an leaf. Like if I feel like okay, I have a headache. It's going to be a legit headache, which I don't get that often. I don't know that Advil is going to touch it. I don't know that I want to take Advil and Tylenol. Let's just take an leave and see what happens. And the funny thing about mixing it up like that is those things can be really effective when you never take them. Yes. Oh my gosh. crazy. Do you remember when we drove, remember after our terrible hospitality experience in Palm Springs, we've done an episode about that long time listeners. Yes. And then remember we drove back because you missed your flight. Yeah, you weren't feeling well. Yes. I felt so bad. I felt like I had had like 40 drinks the night before, but I hadn't. It was the feeling of a hangover, but I I didn't drink enough to worry. that. Wait a second. Did I miss my flight or was my flight canceled? It was canceled. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. I was like, wait a second. No, it was canceled. So we had to drive all the way back to Orange County. Yeah. And I was feeling so terrible. And I think it was the desert. I think I was dehydrated and something else was going on. But I, I, we went to a convenience store and I bought an Aleve and I never take Aleve. And you're so, it's when you haven't taken something like that in a while and your body's not used to it. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is magic. I had a Gatorade and an Aleve. And I felt like, yeah, you did a gazillion bucks. It was funny to watch you like to watch you perk back that morning. Yeah, I know. Oh, poor Sarah. (laughs) Um, one other um, thing that I never really thought that I would use, um, I, I like saline nose drops. I've used those on and off over the years, but I was really nervous about medicated nose sprays. I've heard they can be very addictive. I've heard if you use them too much, like they can eat your septum. <laughs> so yes. I've always been like a little, I don't know, like no thanks. But then about three years ago, I had this persistent throat, um, sore throat. Like it wouldn't go away for like a month, like way too long. And I thought, okay, it's not allergies. It's not 
I'm not sick. I just have this persistent sore throat. And so I went to the doctor and she said, oh, you've had a raging ear infection. And I had also had vertigo, but I never Mm. felt any pain in my ears. Hmm. So very strangely, it only showed up as um, a sore throat. So she just prescribed. She said, anytime you feel like a little pressure in your ears or a sore throat that doesn't go away after a day or two, just hit like hit nose spray for a day or two, like just a couple times a day. Don't overdo it. Don't do it for too long. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm kind of paranoid about getting another ear infection. And I'll, I'll almost even imagine that I feel one coming on. Like I'll think my ears mm-hmm. hurt or that they're starting to feel pressure in them. And so I have Afrin like in my bedroom, in my kitchen. And I'll just think the minute I start to feel that way, I'll, I'll do a, a dose, like a spray that morning, a spray in the evening. And I only do that for two days and then I won't do it again. And I just see what happens. But it really does. I mean, it really does fix the issue. So whether okay, it's that's just, fascinating. Yeah, I know. I know. Is it just dries it up. Is Afrin the same as Flonase? I don't know. Okay. Because um, I had a doctor recently because I was kind of having the same thing. Like I just kind of felt like my ear had like a little bit of pressure and like a little bit of throat, but it wasn't very yeah. bad, but it also wasn't going away. And she suggested yeah. Flonase. And I was like you, I was a little afraid to do it. So I haven't, I did it like one day and I just, then I got scared. So I'm, I'm curious. Okay. So I'm reading this. It says Afrin is a vasoconstrictor that limits fluid infiltration. Um, Flonase is a steroid, which oh, mediates okay. the inflammatory response. So different, you know, yeah. I guess same idea, different purposes. I'll and mix I think, them together. Just let's like, try I'm them all. Do- <laughs> but I think her point was that like, um, you were, you know, you were, ha- you you were having a lot of post nasal something going on that yeah. was collecting in your ears. And I believe she said, you don't want it to go gluey. I'll never forget that word. Ooh. And she's like, it's kind of clear. She said, it's cleared up now, uh, but it could come back and you don't want it to get gluey because that's a problem. And I was like, oh, okay. Huh. And so then she said, if you do this, it'll kind of dry it up and it'll relieve the pressure like right away. So I've really also works. heard if you point the nasal spray away from your septum and like more toward your ear, like a, like yeah. away from the center of your nose, then you don't have that, the, the raw eating, septum. The, yeah. Eating up your septum. Well, Nobody wants of to si- septum. <laughs> So speaking of sinus passages, I had been kind of (laughs) interested in the idea of a neti pot for a long time because there's something so satisfying in my mind about that irrigation and just how natural and I love saline water. So I actually bought one and used it, um, uh, I don't know, a month or so ago when I was having this kind of like vague sinusy throaty and I liked the using of it. I'm not going to say it like magically cured whatever was ailing me, but I learned to use it and that had been something I wanted to. So I, oh. I know like if people are from, if you, people are like regular neti pot users, you're like, yeah, duh, it's not that hard. But for me, it was like, okay, I have to figure out how this works. So that's good. Love it. Okay. Well, it's funny, Megan, because on Sunday we talked about being in our twenties, thirties and forties. And we talked about like just health and wellness in general in our forties. So going into this cold and flu season as a grown up, a, a very grown up 40 year old, What's your like, what is your general approach to like prevention? And we know we can't ward off everything this winter, but do you yeah. have kind of a philosophy around immunity or prevention yourself? I mean, I think most of the basic stuff that either one of us will say, right? Like sleep well, stay hydrated. Don't like try to manage your stress, um, eat nutritious food. I will kind of go off of that a little bit into some supplements, like I'm not one of those people who at the first sign of a cold, I'm like, you know, mega dosing on vitamin C and zinc, but I have before noticed that if I'm starting to feel bad and I take a couple big doses of vitamin C or I used to do like raw garlic, I haven't done that much lately, but I would feel like I knocked a cold out, um, Mm -hmm. or like hot lemon water. Like if I just chug that all day long, I feel better. And I think there is something to the immune boostingness of just feeling like you're doing something like there is mm-hmm. a big mind and body connection. And so I feel like it can't hurt. It's a healthy thing to do anyway. Um, right. As long as you're not like overdoing it and hurting yourself. But like, I think there's no harm. And I have actually been pretty convinced that I've, that I've warded off colds um, with some of those different remedies. So yeah, like I don't, but I don't like think about it all the time. I don't have like a, a regimen or anything like, like a that. ritual. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Kind of on a case by case basis. I think that's I think that's a very wise and balanced way to be. I actually think I forget that those those options, like you said, that whether whether it's really warding it off, whether it's just hate making you feel like you're taking care of yourself, I right. kind of forget that those are an option. And I I generally am 
when people talk about immunity, I think of sleep, water, and yeah. eating well and stress management kind of as like, those feel like if I, if I can do those things, I can't control whether I get sick or not. And right. we did, you know, a year ago, you and I both had influenza or your, I don't know that yours was confirmed, but we both had really gnarly yes, winter stuff gnarly. before, before COVID. Um, so we know it can happen to us. And as we get older, it can happen, you know, more severely. So, um, I guess I try not to control for the, like preventing it completely, but just if I have those like immunity blocks in place, yeah. the sleep and hydration and stress management, um, then hopefully the severity won't be as bad, but I know I'm going to get stuff. And I also have seen before, um, the difference between you get that little bit of starting to feel badness and you try to power through versus you get that little bit of feeling badness and you go to bed. And mm -hmm. I really have felt like there were times when I would have gotten sick if I had not like taken myself to bed with a large cup of, you know, herbal tea yeah. or something and had just tried to like live life normally. I just think there's something to that rest really, really does matter. And you're basically just trying to create an environment where your body can do its job. Yes, that's so, so true. That's so true. Um, and I think it, as we get older and as our kids get older and we maybe have the ability to take a sick day to our, you know, take to our bed for the day where we didn't when they were tiny, might as well, right? Yeah. And just a reminder that our retreat is coming up November 7th. There's a link in the show notes um, and we would love to have you part of that virtual retreat on November 7th. So Megan, this was really fun. We'll talk this to everybody fun. soon. 